I just want to say what a pleasure it is to have Eric Liu here at Politics and Prose tonight, um, not only because he has produced another wonderful book, uh, but because he and I are former colleagues. Um, we worked together in the Clinton White House uh, back in, in the day, and it is such a treat. I think one of the greatest uh, privileges of being a bookseller and running a bookstore is to be able to host people that you worked with, and not only work with, but greatly admire. And um, Eric is uh, at the top of that list, so thank you so much for coming, and we're just so delighted, and congratulations on the book. It's, it's so fun to have you here. Uh, and I want to just say that for those of you who have read his books, you know that they're sources of inspiration for anyone who seeks to understand our world, um, and more importantly, for people who want to do better in that world. His latest book is no exception. It's called A Chinaman's Chance, One Family's Journey, and the Chinese American Dream. And it's been called a memoir by a lot of people, uh, and it is through his family story that he considers and explains the confluences of two extraordinary phenomena of the past half century. The, traje the trajectory, mostly upward, of um, Chinese Americans in this country and the rise of China as a global power and player. Uh, but I was talking uh, earlier this evening to Rafe Segalan, who's somewhere here. Rafe, where are you? In the back. Rafe is uh, uh, obviously one of the, the um, best known and most respected literary agents um, in the industry also a great friend to politics and prose, and also Eric's agent. And we were talking about how this is really not a traditional memoir. You know, you think of memoir, and you think, oh, it's just somebody telling their life story. It's really, I think, more of a kind of an exploration of cultural identity. And he examines very closely and in really, really evocative, interesting, and lively ways the roles of heritage, language, custom, uh, and geography that defines uh, one's person and character, but also the sort of collective identities of whole groups of people. Um, and I was going to tell the facial hair story, but I think I'll let people read that. It's very funny. Um, you can just imagine where that was going to go. Um, he's, he's a lively writer. He's a gifted uh, storyteller, a very, very creative thinker. And I think the other thing that's important about this book is he brings to the telling of his tale uh, a very deep and abiding faith in democratic values and the role of citizenship. And if you really think about his career, few people in any of the realms that he has operated in, writing, advocacy, policy, expertise, cultural and political commentary, a uh, few people have so neatly combined their interests and passions in the way that, that Eric has. He was, I think many of you know, um, a speechwriter for President Clinton. Don Baer is here tonight, who was uh, the director of that office for both of us, over both of us for a while. We were talking about the Normandy speeches earlier this evening. Um, he was also a domestic policy advisor to President Clinton. He's written books, as you know, commentary pieces. Um, and perhaps uh, equally important, he's the founder of Citizen University, which offers programs on the national scale and conferences that teach the art of citizenship. Uh, that seek to strengthen our democracy through an elevation of our civic life. And I really honestly today can think of virtually nothing more important than that. Um, in fact, I was thinking it sounds like enrollment uh, in some of your programs should be required of all Americans, young and old, and maybe we could start with Congress. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I would also say that as much as that should be required courses for people, I think a Chinaman's chance should be required reading for, for people both within our own country and well beyond our borders. So please join me in a hearty welcome for Eric Liu. My goodness, Lisa, that was really um, such a warm and wonderful welcome. And I'm so, so excited to be here. Uh, today. This is. Uh, well, I was just about to. <laughs> there are so many uh, friends uh, uh, here this evening and so many uh, people who I haven't seen either in, uh, in some cases, days and in some cases, decades, uh, and uh, just delighted at the full spectrum of it. Uh, uh, but I wanted in particular to acknowledge uh, uh, my mother, Julia Liu, who's here. Can you wave hi? <laughs> <coughs> Uh, my fiance, Janae Kane, who's over here. <laughs> uh, and we've already heard about my agent, Rafe Segalan, who's way back here. Um, all three of whom have just been um, so central to, uh, well, my life, but particularly in this book, um, uh, in the thinking and conversation that made this book possible. Um, I really, Lissa, wanted just to thank you and Politics and Prose. I mean, this is, I was standing here as we were getting ready to get going and uh, someone just said, isn't it exciting to be here in the Mecca 
Uh, and that's exactly how you feel when you're in the word business, in the book business. Uh, politics and prose in Washington, D.C. is about uh, as, you know, Mecca of the Mecca uh, and just a great place to, to be. And, uh, you know, we were talking before the program got started uh, in Lissa's office about the, the place that institutions like this have um, in our society at this moment. Uh, and as Lissa mentioned, a lot of the work that I do uh, is about trying to revitalize and rekindle a spirit of citizenship uh, here in the United States. And to me, one very basic aspect of that is being able still to see one another, to just see one another as human beings, to hear one another, to kind of experience the way that we are talking and listening and get a sense of how we differ from one another. Uh, and, you know, those opportunities, those kinds of civic spaces are evaporating uh, in modern society. Uh, and as they er evaporate more quickly, places like this become all the more important. They loom all the more uh, large uh, in the way that we try to find meaning and community. Uh, so we're really just thank you for, for everything you do um, for authors like me and for a community like this. I wanted just to um, tell you a little bit about this book today. And as Lissa said, speak for 20 or so minutes uh, to give you a sense of what A Chinaman's Chance is about. Uh, and then really open it up for what I hope will be a true conversation. I mean, I welcome Q&A uh, coming to me, but I also think it would be delightful just for you all to respond to each other uh, uh, as we engage in some of these ideas. Um, let me describe this book for you here a little bit. A Chinaman's Chance uh, is on one level a book of essays uh, about being Chinese American in this moment of China and America, uh, this consequential moment where China is rising, America is less sure of its place in the world, uh, we're in a period of remarkable uh, inequality, uh, economic inequality in our society, also a period of remarkable demographic flux, all of which is making it harder and harder than ever to answer the most simple, fundamental American question, which is, who is us? Who is us? How do we hold together a sense of our nationhood and a sense of our coherent collective identity in a time of change like this? And that would be true under any circumstance with the kinds of flux and strain that we're experiencing right now, but particularly in the context and in a sense in the shadow of China's rise, uh, these questions of who is us become all the more urgent uh, and all the more salient. Uh, so on one level, the book is a book of essays about these topics that explore uh, different aspects of the Chinese American experience, both my family's and uh, the experience throughout uh, the history of this country. Uh, in culture, in art, in politics, in business, in civic life. Uh, but really, what this book is, is two different stories, woven together in strand after strand um, in something of a double helix. Uh, and the two stories are, number one, the story of my own family's journey uh, to the United States and the ways in which uh, my family has, uh, each generation, tried to uh, place a certain claim on America and what that has meant and what that has looked like and where that has worked and where that has not. Uh, the second story that's interwoven with that is simply the story of America today reckoning with itself. America beginning to realize that Americanness and, and an idea of whiteness, which for so many decades and centuries in this country's history were essentially conflated and seen to be one and the same, are now splitting apart. And now that there is an idea of America that isn't just about a white male default, that isn't just about kind of a basic expectation of how um, whites in this country define our terms of engagement. And so these two stories interwoven, the story of my own family's journey and arc, uh, and the story of America's reckoning with its creed and its idea, and whether the idea of a truly race transcendent country like this can indeed come to pass, uh, are what um, I try to weave together in the pages of this book. I want to say a word about each of these. So story number one, my family's story. Uh, the way I begin it in a sense in this book is um, uh, thinking about my grandfather, my father's father, um, whose name in Chinese and Mandarin uh, was Liu Guoyun. Um, and those of you who are Mandarin speakers know Liu is a family name. Uh, Guoyun roughly translates as deliverance or destiny of the nation. So, you know, no pressure, right? Just a <clears throat> Just a big old name for this guy who grew up in rural China, the son of a farmer, uh, but who grew up at a time and in a period in China's history where everything was now up for grabs, where dynastic rule had come to an end, where the Republic of China was beginning to cohere, uh, and where someone, particularly someone given the name Liu Guoyun, 
might imagine himself as part of a destiny greater than just a workaday destiny. And so this young man, my grandfather, uh, went to the first military academy of the First Republic of China, uh, became a pilot, uh, fought in the Air Force uh, during the war against Japan and later in the war against uh, uh, the communists in China. Uh, and I never knew my grandfather. I knew him only from a very kind of serious, almost severe black and white photograph of him in uniform that was looking down at me uh, from the study of our home uh, growing up. And uh, when I looked at that picture and thought about this man who I'd never known, but thought about the idea that his identity, his story, and his name embodied, I had to ask myself as a kid growing up, what would it mean for me to try to deliver a nation? What would be the nation that I would want to deliver? And that question is one that, um, in a sense, is the seed that my grandfather planted. And what I tell in the pages of this book are the ways in which his sons, my father was one of six sons, um, which itself was kind of remarkable and in some ways auspicious, um, how they all charted lives and stories that in their own way were American, Chinese American, and then ultimately not so American. Um, one by one, those sons came to the United States uh, uh, for education, for higher education. One by one, uh, they began to make lives here in the United States, uh, working at universities, working in engineering and scientific organizations, IBMs and Bell Labs and places like that. One by one, they raised families in America. They raised families in little colonial houses on streets with names like French Hill Road and Marywood Lane and uh, places like that. And one by one, each of them began to find themselves enmeshed in the fabric of American life. And that is part of the story, particularly for their generation. But what I also tell in the pages of this book is the way in which, one by one, many of my uncles came to realize that their fullest sense of self their fullest potential, their full passion, their full range of abilities and talents were not getting recognized here in the context of the United States. That our society, for a variety of reasons, large organizations, tradition, institutional bias, you name it, was not seeing them for the full human beings that they were. And what was, I suppose, fortunate for them was that just at the time when they became restless and sensing that there was a there was more opportunity for them to express who their fullest selves were. That was also the time when Taiwan and what was called then the Asian Tigers of Southeast Asia came to the fore in the 1980s. And suddenly now there was all kinds of opportunity to be found not here in the United States, but back where they had been raised in Taiwan, uh, at this point not quite yet in mainland China, but throughout Asia. And so one by one, several of my uncles returned and found their destinies back in Taiwan, in higher education, in business, in government and in politics, uh, where for the rest of their careers, they found remarkable success as entrepreneurs, as university presidents, and in one case, uh, ultimately, as the premier, the prime minister of the Republic of China. And I think about that, and I tell that story. On the one hand, you can say, wow, my grandfather's name was fulfilled. The promise of that name was fulfilled. But I, who was born here in the United States, I of the second generation, think about that story and I think, that was a failure of my nation. That was a failure of the United States, not to have fully capitalized upon the talent and the passion and the ability of these people and given them the fullest possible field in which those abilities could flower. That was a failure of this country. And that is a story here that I think Many Americans, whether Chinese Americans or not, can reckon with, and it's not just a story of the 1980s, it's a story of here and now, and the question of whether we are doing all we can in a spirit of openness and in a spirit of total inclusion to capitalize upon our full talents. I proceed then in this book to tell the story of just uh, what it is like as a second generation son of immigrants to become a father of a third generation child. Uh, and I've got a teenager now, 15 year old daughter, uh, who is third generation Chinese American, half Chinese ethnically. Uh, and a lot of the story that I tell, partly just about our relationship, is the story that is woven through language and culture uh, about what is Chineseness? How much does she have to hold on to and how much do I have to pass on for her in some sense, some unquantifiable sense, to still count as Chinese? And so some of the stories that I describe are stories of just simple reckoning with language uh, and the ways in which uh, from the time she was a little kid I tried to send her to Chinese school 
Uh, and as is the fate of almost every parent who tries to send a kid to Chinese school, I, they, I met with great resistance uh, and finally decided at a certain age, okay, I won't send you to this boring Chinese school on Saturday anymore. Let's make a deal. You and I will do a tutorial every week. Every week, you and I will spend an hour or two together, and I will teach you from my textbooks, from sometimes childhood textbooks, sometimes college textbooks, what I know of Chinese. Uh, and she amazingly agreed to the deal. And what we ended up doing and have been doing for the last five, six years now uh, is this very Americanized way of learning Chinese, this very intermingled, fused way in which we don't follow any more of the exercises in the book, which give you very boring sentences like the river is long, the mountains are high, you know, things like that. But she, we've come up with games where she makes up random nonsense American sentences. The castle has 23 turkeys running across the field, you know, or my, my foot has a little village inside it. She'll just make up random crazy sentences and my job is to translate them into Mandarin and then teach them to her and teach her the proper sentence structure, the proper pronunciation, the way to write these uh, words uh, in this way that is essentially a way of playing. And what I am reflecting on a lot in the pages of this book is, on the one hand, this playful, integrative spirit of teaching and passing on a heritage and an identity is very American. On the other hand, I'm always asking myself, are we just playing at this? Is this just a game? Is there just something superficial here? Uh, where do we get to the depth? Uh, and that family story, I think, any story of first to second to third generation uh, dissolution, dilution, diminishment uh, of a culture core uh, is an American story as well, and how we reckon with that and how we try to preserve that. All of that, as I say, is woven into uh, the second greater story of America's destiny, of America's purpose and mission. And the story that I try to tell in these pages is one that is beyond that of my family. It really is the story of how Chinese Americans from the time that uh, Chinese immigrants began to arrive here in significant numbers in the 1800s and the 1850s have in ways unseen and unrecognized by most of America changed every aspect of American life. Now there are obvious instances like laying down the tracks of the transcontinental railroad. Uh, there are less obvious instances like uh, the way that Chinese immigrants changed our language, our palate, our cuisine. Uh, but more deeply, what I try to reckon with here is the ways in which Chinese Americans throughout have contested American values, have challenged America's words and creed. And one of the stories, or two of the stories that I juxtapose are uh, one of a fellow named Wang Kim Ark in the late 1800s, and one of a fellow named Wen Ho Li in the late uh, 1900s. Wang Kim Ark, some of you may know if you are legal uh, constitutional aficionados, um, was a cook born in San Francisco in the mid-1800s uh, who decided at some point in the late uh, uh, 1880s, maybe 1890, that he would go to China and visit family, visit relatives there. And when he came back from his trip to China and tried to disembark at the port in San Francisco, he was denied re-entry. Why? because this was the era of Chinese exclusion. That since 1882, the United States had had a law on the books, the first in the history of the Republic, barring entry of all Chinese. The first time in the history of our Republic that an entire group, just on the basis of race, had been told, stay out. And so when Wang Kim Ark came back and he tried to get off the boat in San Francisco, he was told, you are a, you are a Chinese subject to exclusion. You're not allowed in. And what he did was he, well, he exercised his rights as an American. He got himself, he got lawyered up. <laughs> he began to make a claim. And his lawyers and he began to publicize this case. And they told a story that is as simple as Section 1 of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. All persons born or naturalized in the United States shall be citizens of the United States. Period. And with that sentence, he went to federal court and his case moved up from district court to the Court of Appeals and ultimately to the United States Supreme Court, where in United States versus Wong Kim Ark, the Supreme Court had to agree that much as they didn't like it, distasteful as they may find Chinese immigrants, and as much as they recognized the ways in which Chinese immigrants were in some ways corrupting different parts of American society, but that the language of the 14th Amendment was plain. 
and that to read it against the Chinese would require them to have to read it against thousands of people of Scotch or Irish or German parentage, and that that simply wouldn't do. And so in that case in 1898, the principle of birthright citizenship was established, a principle that today in 2014 is at the very heart of all of our immigration disputes and debates, at the very heart of the controversy going on at the southern border right now, at the very heart of this blown up fear that exists in our politics of immigrants coming here illegally in order that they might have quote unquote anchor babies and have those babies on American soil so that they can get a foothold in on our territory and take over and invade the United States. That language, that fear that so dominates today's immigration debates and our cultural and political conversation has its roots in a Chinese American litigant. Fast forward a, another hundred years and Wen Ho Lee, who many of you have heard of, a nuclear scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories, an immigrant born in China, raised in Taiwan, like my uncles, like anybody who, like so many people I knew, soft-spoken, mild-mannered, many ties still to his homeland, a great sense of connection to the culture of China and to Taiwan. And he found himself in the late uh, 1990s accused as a spy at a time when China had made sudden, somewhat unexplained advances in their nuclear weaponry programs. And all of a sudden, all eyes swiveled to this Chinese guy working on our nuclear program. And everybody said, this guy might be a spy. And without any particular substantiation, Wen Ho Lee ended up spending the better part of the next year uh, standing accused, 89 counts of espionage and various variations of espionage, a 60-something year old man, a little guy, not a forceful, scary fiscal presence, ended up in solitary confinement in shackles for 23 hours a day, held as an enemy of the state. And he too, he too, you think about that and you think that is a betrayal. That is a betrayal of every idea of what this country is and should be. But what he too did was he pressed a claim. He got lawyered up as well, but more than lawyers, he got advocates. He got friends both in the Chinese American community and well beyond to say, hold on a second, this is not right. Hold on a second, this is not okay. And this was the administration that I used to work for that was prompting all of this. So I make no partisan comment here. This was a moment in American history that nobody, Chinese, American, or any other ethnicity should be particularly proud of. Uh, and in the end, after a year plus uh, of these trumped up charges, uh, Win Ho Lee was essentially let go. 88 of the 89 charges were dropped. He was found guilty of one minor charge of mishandling sensitive documents. Uh, and no one in the government, with the exception of a federal judge in his case, Judge James Parker in the District Court of New Mexico, issued an apology. But in that apology, what the judge said was essentially a reminder to us all. What he said to Win Ho Lee in his closing statement was, you know better than I, Dr. Lee, as a naturalized citizen, what the Constitution of the United States is and means. And what he said was, on behalf of the entire judiciary system of the United States, I apologize. And you can think about the arc of that story and think it is a story of betrayal, not the betrayal of Win Ho Lee against his country, but the betrayal of his country against him. And yet at the same time, it is a story of redemption. It is a story of people saying, hold on a second, there is this hypocritical gap between the American creed, the idea of liberty and equality and race-blind race ideas of everybody having a fair shot. There is a hypocritical gap between those ideals and the actual practices of our institutions. And we can look at that gap and ask ourselves a simple question. Do we, looking at that gap, decide, well, we throw up our hands. America is a hypocrite, and America is never going to be what it promises or says it's going to be. Or do we look at that gap and say, what it means to claim citizenship, what it main, means to claim Americanness, is to close that gap, is to stand up, to make your voice heard, to assert your belonging and your inclusion and your identity here on your own terms. And that, to me, is a particular story, whether you're talking about Wong Kim Ark 100 plus years ago or Win Ho Lee just a decade or two ago. The question for all of us right now is how do we close that gap? How do we bridge that great divide between what we say we are and what we are? And I think in this moment right now where China is rising and America is less sure of itself, 
one of the things that I think we have to remember, that we get to remember, is that Americans of Chinese descent actually have something to say about this. That Americans of Chinese descent actually embody a fusion of styles, of values, of mores, of ways of thinking about things and people and problems and solutions that might just well provide a pathway forward for the United States. And a lot of what I end up telling in this book that weaves both story one of my family and story two of my country is about the ways in which all of these classically American ideas and traits of character, if you want to put it this way, of rugged individualism and rampant materialism and raw self-seeking on the one hand, with these more classically Chinese ethics of thinking about context and social place and belonging and obligations and responsibilities, not only rights and privileges. How these two things fused together actually are a synthesis that the United States needs right now and in many ways the world could use right now. And the great interesting thing and in, in a way irony about the world right now is that just at the very time when the United States is becoming more fragmented, more atomized, more individualistic, where there's more isolation, and we are yearning and in search of some greater sense of being part of something greater than ourselves, just at the time when we could use a great big dose of Chineseness, China is in some ways going the other way. China is beginning to realize that they can use a greater dose of American individualism, greater dose of American creativity, a greater dose of American imagination, a greater dose of American freedom from convention, a greater dose of American willingness to mix and match and hybridize. And so it's fascinating in this age and in this time right now to think about the synthesis that is unfolding on the planetary scale, but the synthesis also that here in our country is unfolding in the lives of Chinese Americans. And ultimately, this is why I'm exceedingly optimistic about this country's fate. And the way that I try to summarize it and the way that I'll close these remarks is simply this, that no matter how surpassingly great China's economy becomes, how large their GDP becomes, how mighty their military is, it doesn't matter. I don't care. And indeed, their GDP is likely at some point at the end of this year to surpass uh, that of the United States. But the United States will always retain a deep, enduring competitive advantage if we don't blow it. And I summarize that advantage this way. America makes Chinese Americans. China does not make American Chinese. China does not want to make American Chinese. China does not know how to make American Chinese. China is not interested. It's not in their purpose or civilizational operating system to take people from all over the planet, to fuse and welcome and integrate them into their society and let them, empower them, to change the very meaning and the core and the idea of their society. To have immigrants come to China and change the meaning of Chineseness. That is not what goes on there. But to have immigrants come here and enter into society, enter into letters and arts and politics and business is the very point of here. It is not just a, a feature, an incidental benefit. It is our purpose. And it is the reason why we will have an adaptability and a resilience and a capacity to be flexible again if we don't blow it. And this is why in this moment right now where there is so much fear and a lot of it is prompted by the sense that everybody's falling behind and that the pie is finite and everybody's slice is getting cut thinner and thinner. In this moment of anxiety and fear and status anxiety, it is easier than ever for us to lurch toward xenophobia. It is easier than ever for us to get away from habits of inclusion and fusion and synthesis. But those habits of inclusion and fusion and synthesis are not just the American way, they are the American advantage. And in this moment of China and America, the Chinese American advantage is to remind the rest of us of that. And we remind that in our lives and in our stories uh, and in the ways that we move in all these different parts of our society. I want to close simply actually with the way in which I open the book, uh, which is just a one and a half page prologue here and then just uh, uh, open up for conversation. Uh, because this prologue, in a sense, describes, um, well, it describes what I think our opportunity is. My father, who had an ironic sense of humor, took a certain delight from the phrase, a Chinaman's chance. People don't use that 19th century expression anymore, but most of us still know what it means. 
no chance in hell. Dad sometimes liked to jest about prosaic situations like getting to the store before closing, that neither he nor I had a Chinaman's chance. Of course, he tried hard all his life here to prove that, to prove that saying wrong. So have I, and so have nearly four million Americans of Chinese descent. The census tells us that Chinese Americans today have among the highest incomes and highest levels of education of any ethnic group in America. Our senses tell us that there is more to the picture. There are Chinese Americans of s stories of striving and struggle that don't fit the box of a government form or the narrative of the model minority, from families who've been here many generations to lone migrants who arrived yesterday. And the gleaming promise and looming menace of modern China colors the perception of people who look like me and indeed colors our own self-perceptions. The great American kaleidoscope of immigration and acculturation, the tumbling fractal dance of colors colliding, of fusion and diffusion, has turned for over a century and a half for the Chinese of America. With each generation, we have changed this country, its laws and voice and palette and face. The kaleidoscope gyrates still, but now in a world where the Chinese of China also have something to say about what it is to matter and to have influence and to be seen. What does it mean to be Chinese American in this moment of China and America? It means being a vessel for all the anxieties and hopes that attend the arrival of China on the world scene. It means creating a new template for American immigrant arrival. The Chinese cannot be reduced to new Jews. The history of the Chinese in America is unique and richer than most know. It means being a test case for some of the great questions of our day. Does Chinese culture somehow confer a competitive advantage? Is it possible for America, the planet's most efficient hybridizer of cultures, to capitalize fully on the talents and passions and character of those of us of Chinese ancestry. Here in the pages to follow are the reflections of one Chinaman on chance, on the role of chance in his own family's journey, and on the chance America still has to be something greater than the sum of its many tinted parts. That's I want to thank you, and I really would like to now just open it up for conversation and questions and uh, reflections. And again, thank all of you for uh, being here this evening. Thank you for a very eloquent presentation and a very thoughtful one at that, too. In the preparation of your book, have you come across other individuals, Hispanic Americans, Greek Americans, Jewish Americans, that have written similar contributions to the great melting pot that we are so fortunate to be a part of? It's a great question. And for those of you who could not hear it, um, uh, it was es essentially whether in my travels I've come across books in a similar spirit and vein from uh, Americans of other ethnicities and other immigrant uh, uh, heritages um, that speak in similar ways. And uh, the answer uh, is, uh, Lissa, probably a shelf of books here in politics and prose, um, uh, certainly throughout uh, American history, but even in this moment right now. Uh, this is a remarkable moment. Uh, uh, one book that I would actually commend to you uh, that is not written in the same personal uh, way that I wrote, but is a great survey of uh, the demographic flux in our country right now, uh, is a book called The Next America uh, by Paul Taylor, uh, who's a senior uh, researcher at Pew. Uh, and has written a great deal about uh, both uh, in ethnic diversity and generational change, uh, the shift in our country's sense of itself. Uh, and one of the things that I would say, whether it's a book like that or um, I'm reading a wonderful novel right now by, uh, I'm not per quite sure how to pronounce the first name, Teju Cole, called Open City, um, uh, a Nigerian-American author writing um, essentially um, in this beautifully reflective, meandering way uh, about life in New York City, but essentially life in America, and essentially uh, life in a country where there's so little to hold us together except some distant set of creedal ideals, right? And how uh, in the shadow of those ideals, which loom over us saying, live up to us, live up to us, live up to us, how in day-to-day -day life we fail to live up to them, how in day-to-day -day life we fail to see one another, fail to empathize with one another. Um, uh, and so there are so many authors of so many different uh, um, uh, heritages right now writing about these questions of 
who is us. Um, but one thing I would like to just add uh, in response to your, your comment and question uh, is on the, the, the phrase itself, melting pot, uh, which I think is um, sort of shorthand in American life for uh, the process of immigrant uh, arrival and in integration. Uh, and it's actually a phrase that I generally avoid using, um, or at least avoid using about America in 2014. Uh, there was a period, maybe America in 1914, or America in 1814, where the idea of melting people from different places uh, into an, a, 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 a monochrome whole um, probably describes something real. And that was a time when the immigrants to this country in the main were varieties of Europeans. Right? And so what happened in this country was that somehow you got Greeks, and you got Jews, and you got Germans, and you got Italians, and you got Frenchmen, and you got folks from all across Europe, and they all came here and they melted into white people. And this process of becoming white is one of the great American inventions. <laughs> uh, it, it is something that uh, uh, when you think about European history, um, even Europe today, um, Germans have very strong opinions about Greeks and their ways. And Greeks have very strong opinions about Germans and their ways. Uh, but uh, over here in the United States, over the centuries, they all melted into something called white. And that process, uh, uh, you know, you might have rightly called melting pot. But today, the goal and the point of becoming American is not to become white. My goal, my family's goal, my parents when they came here, me as a second generation kid claiming this country is not to become white or to hold up whiteness or to valorize uh, and re-underscore whiteness. It is to redefine American. It is to change it so that when you do the quick word association game and someone says American and you ask what face pops in your head, it doesn't always have to be a face that looks like my former boss Bill Clinton or looks like Mitt Romney, that it can be a face that looks like mine or my mother's, right? And that our job right now is to change that. And it's less about a melting pot and more about streams converging and changing one another in different ways. And the waters of all of these different heritages allow us to invent and define our identities as separate from heritage. And American identity, which is the synthesis, which is this fusion and this great, beautiful, messy, complicated, contradictory hybrid, is the point. Uh, and the more we can do that, um, and not necessarily melt us into a single block, um, the more I think we'll be fulfilling our, our, uh, our destiny. I'm going to go over to this microphone next and then come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm Chinese, and we have strong family feelings. And first of all, I want to congratulate your mother for having raised such an accomplished <laughs> son. <laughs> <laughs> My request is if you could make some comments about double citizenship. I think that's a very difficult thought hmm. for many of us to contemplate. The question was about um, uh, the idea of double citizenship. And, and if I might, I, I might expand the idea just to double identity. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of shorthand ways that people talk about books like mine is uh, person X, quote, caught between two cultures, right? Torn between two worlds, um, stretched between two identities. Uh, and I'm not totally sure, again, at the level of the second generation, uh, that I accept that framing, which is so predominant in the way we, we talk about American identity. Um, of course, there are times where there is a tug and there is a conflict. Um, but there are other times as well where what we are doing, particularly those of us in the second generation, but it's true as well uh, of my mother and the immigrant generation, and it's certainly true of my daughter and the third generation and the fourth beyond, um, is that we are creating, again, new complicated hybrids um, that aren't necessarily about a, an irreconcilable tension between two cultures. Um, one of the, uh, I want to tell you about two people who I write about in this book, two people who are um, alive and active today uh, in American life. Uh, one is a woman named Ai Jen Poo, uh, who's the daughter of immigrants from Taiwan. Uh, and some of you may have heard of her. She's a great American activist. She was uh, one of the Time 100 last year or two years ago, uh, seen as this just rising star in American civic life. And Ai Jen is the founder of something called the National Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, essentially a, 
uh, a coalition uh, to organize nannies and domestic workers and caregivers and home care workers uh, who don't otherwise have representation and voice. Uh, and as we know, most of us in this country, that base of domestic workers in the United States is a largely non-white population caring for an aging, largely white population, right? Uh, and the way that iGen has gone about this work has been in some ways, you might call it classically American. She's, she's got all of the feistiness and the fearlessness of a labor organizer from the 1900s. She'll get out there, she'll get arrested, she'll do things, she'll protest, she'll make noise, she'll do things that I, I bet, I haven't met her parents, make her parents a little bit uncomfortable, right? Uh, at the same time, a big part of her strategy uh, to make this more than simply one particular niche of the labor market looking out for its own narrow interest has been, she, has been that she has created an umbrella campaign that envelops her work and that of many others like her called Caring Across Generations. And the idea of caring across generations is to get people on a human empathetic level to recognize all of these aging largely white people who are, who are going to be for the rest of our lives in need of more care at home and otherwise and all of these largely non-white caregivers to have them see one another, to have them recognize one another, not only in an employment relationship, but as on an empathetic human level, as sons, as daughters, as fathers, as mothers, as grandchildren and grandparents, right? And I think about the way that iGen has created this program, this campaign called Caring Across Generations, and I cannot think of a more Chinese organizing strategy. I cannot think of a way of trying to activate things that has more of this ethic of we are woven into a fabric of relationship and obligation, and when we tend to it, we are stronger together, right? Her embodiment of these American and Chinese styles and ways of being um, is a great one. Uh, another one some of you may have heard of, a guy named Tony Shea. Tony um, is an entrepreneur. He created Zappos.com, where uh, I bet more than a few people here have bought shoes. Um, <laughs> Zappos, a super successful online emporium, which then Amazon bought for a billion dollars, I believe. And uh, Tony is a pretty young man still, a successful entrepreneur, um, on the one hand, embodies again this classically American story. The solo entrepreneur, second generation kid, who goes against all kind of conventional wisdom, right? Everybody told him, Amazon's already got this space. You don't, no one's going to buy shoes online. You have to try them on. And they told him all the hundred reasons why Zappos.com was going to fail. And like a true great American entrepreneur, he pressed, he pressed, he pressed, he stuck with his vision, uh, and he made a mint, right? But the Chinese part of his story is this, that what he has done with his fortune is he's invested in the years since he, uh, his company was acquired, he has invested $300 million of his own money in downtown Las Vegas which is actually where he's also moved his company. His company had been based in Henderson, Nevada, outside of Vegas. And he decided to take downtown Vegas, this kind of forgotten, dilapidated neighborhood off the strip that people weren't paying attention to, where kind of vintage Las Vegas is. And he has said, we're going to move our company here. We're going to have our employees live here. And we're going to turn this little desert, this civic cultural desert, into an oasis of arts, imagination, creativity, entrepreneurship, uh, imagination. Uh, and so he's invested money to revitalize and to build, but he's also brought in artists and entrepreneurs and innovators from the sciences and business, business worlds and education uh, to make flowers bloom in this place, but to create a community where only, as you can imagine, I mean, there is no more atomized, fragmented, short-term thinking American place than Las Vegas. Uh, he has created this true garden. And I think about that fusion again of Chinese and American styles and ways um, that is, um, again, the hybrid that we can be at our best. When it comes to literally the question of citizenship, as in documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States, um, you know, I think dual citizenship is, uh, uh, is itself a complicated idea. Um, my work at Citizen University in promoting American citizenship, we don't focus on the documentation status. I'm not talking about whether you have the papers. Uh, because quite frankly, uh, and some of you may have been following my friend and colleague over the last few weeks, Jose Antonio Vargas, uh, the undocumented journalist who uh, was detained at the southern border, Pulitzer Prize winner, activist and advocate for so many millions of young, voiceless, undocumented uh, people in this country, um, who is a remarkable journalist and advocate and citizen. Jose 
lacks the papers, but is a bigger citizen than most people I know who have the papers. Most people who have the status but don't live like citizens. Uh, and so, me, so for me, I define citizenship in this broadest sense of how do you show up for community? How do you show up for other people? How do you participate? How do you claim? How do you contribute? How do you see the purpose of your life not just as I will get mine for me and a million people getting theirs for them will somehow magically arise to the common good? No. How do we intentionally do something to build something together? That is citizenship. Uh, and that can be done whether your passport says United States, Republic of China, People's Republic of China, uh, or in Jose's case, the Philippines. Um, and uh, you know the, the spirit that I think we need to invigorate in this country right now is that spirit of claiming and committing um, to the kind of community that we are right now. Yes, sir. All right, so first of all, I want to thank you for your talk. It was pretty thought-provoking. And second, uh, well, I'm not as articulate as you are, so I'm sorry if this question comes awkwardly phrased. But uh, so I know that the talk bill writes about American democracy not being able to work unless everyone participates and everyone participates in the local level. But sort of piggybacking onto what you just said earlier, I know like a lot of Chinese Americans where I come from don't participate in like the full American experience. Many of them feel like they're hands off and it's not their problem. Whereas, I'm sorry. <laughs> She's but, speaking yeah, up. It's good. <laughs> I mean, like, my, my dad was the same way until I sort of forced him to be a participant in our community. So I was wondering then, what would you say to those people to galvanize them, galvanize them to work on social issues and say community issues and be a part of the full American experience? And what would be a good starting point for that? That's a great question. I, I want to throw it back initially to you to say, what did you say to your dad when you, when you quote, forced him to become a, a more active participant? Well, uh, I, he really likes to sing, so I just told him to follow his passions, and then he eventually joined the Chinese chorus because of that. So it wasn't so much a community service thing as opposed to his own passions, but it eventually evolved into something in which he volunteered with the community a lot, the Asian American community in Massachusetts. Yeah. So, so uh, could you all hear that in the back? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you have answered your own question in part, right? Uh, I think there's two parts to, to, to the answer of how do we get... Um, you know, in this case, Chinese Americans uh, of all generations who haven't been as actively engaged and uh, uh, and prominent in public life and civic affairs, uh, uh, but it's true, of course, of everybody, right? But what I would say in particular about Chinese Americans is, number one, as you say, uh, getting to this question of motivation, right? Uh, and sometimes the motivation is your passion, right? right. Um, sometimes it is simply... Uh, affinity. Uh, my mother is involved in a thing called CAPA, the Chinese American Professionals Association, right, uh, which has a huge uh, set of operations here in the greater D.C. area. And these are people who, for professional reasons, want to find affinity groups and be able to learn from one another and create networks and so on and so forth. That kind of first tapping that intrinsic motivation uh, as step number one for stepping out of your own particular small island. Um, but the second thing I would say, and maybe this is a species of motivation, um, uh, is about um, the, the language that I use as a second generation American is about earning it, right? So I am second generation. I am the son of immigrants. I, I essentially won the lottery by being born in the United States at the time that I did. I won the lottery of peace, prosperity, opportunity, an ability to get educated, an ability for to enter into a society and to grow up to be in environments like this. Um, when you look at the global scene, when you look even at most people in China today, they do not enjoy what we in this moment right now are enjoying, right? I won the lottery as a second generation American, as a son of immigrants. Uh, and a lot of my life, and this I think would be true even if my grandfather's name weren't what it is, uh, would be this preoccupation of with the question, how do I earn it? How do I earn every opportunity I've been given? Because I didn't do a thing to get what I've gotten here. I did not, right? My parents took the great risk and the great leap across an ocean. Uh, they built a life here. Uh, our society uh, uh, created institutions where I could get an education, where I could learn to think about these larger questions and do so uh, in peace and prosperity and with purpose. Um, uh, Lisa and I were talking earlier, and, and Don Baer, my former uh, White House speechwriting colleague, he and I have been talking recently. Um, uh, just a month ago, 
Uh, I went to uh, Normandy uh, with Janae uh, for the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, and that's because 20 years ago, Don and I and a friend of ours, Jeremy Rosner and others, uh, had worked on the speeches for President Clinton to deliver for the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the Allied invasion of Normandy, right? And you think about, you think about something as simple as D-Day. You think about a day like that when the tide of history turns for the planet. And you think about what those people did for us. And the question in a moment like that is literally every day, what do we do to earn it? What do we do to live up to that, right? And so part of the message that I would have to any Chinese American right now is people have gone to great lengths for you to have a voice. People have gone to great lengths for you to have an opportunity to be your fullest self. Earn it. Don't waste it, right? You, and, and this actually plays on their Chinese sense of obligation. You owe it to your parents. You owe it to prior generations. You owe it to the people who made the hard choices to come here to not just squander it by essentially just living a boring, normal American private life, right? Um, and I think that uh, I, th that is one of the things that I think, you know, the third motivation, I suppose, and this is one that I hope does not come to pass, but stories like that of Win Ho Lee remind us that it does come to pass, um, is to inoculate against bad. You participate now. You claim now, you show up now, you get standing and voice in politics and civic life and the life of your neighborhood and your community now, so that when the next Win Ho Lee comes along, right, and the next person comes along who's accused of being a spy, and all of a sudden all people who have this phenotype, this genotype, suddenly kind of zzz, the matrix shifts and all non-Chinese Americans start looking at my face a little bit differently, with a little bit more suspicion, with a little bit more, huh, are you, wh where are you from again? Huh, what's your deal, right? When those moments come, it behooves me, it behooves us to have inoculated ourselves against that by saying, hey, allow me to remind you, I'm an American. And allow me to remind you that I have claimed that status, not simply because of the documents in my pocket, but because of the deeds and the acts that I have been doing over and over and over again about something bigger than just me, right? I think that's the way we, uh, we activate some of this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, why don't I take both of your, uh, or I'll take uh, your questions and I'll just try to su sum up how, how that's. <clears throat> My name is Bob Spiegel. First of all, I want to compliment you on your writing. I read Accidental Asian and your writing is beautiful. Thank you. As an ethnologist and immigration lawyer, I want to compliment you on the substance of issues that you raise. My question is, historically, what's defined nations, be they the United States, China, Japan, or what have you, has been having a common language, culture, and history. And while China has 51 minority groups, they're not as disparate as the 200 minority groups that we have, which pose a different challenge for us. And, and Japan is the most homogenous country on Earth. So they don't have the same challenge as we do. And so I'd like to ask you how we deal with what has defined nations in the past and whether we should define nation that way in the future. Great. Great question. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Um, uh, my, uh, my name is Frank, and I'm from China. Uh, very, I know Frank is a very American name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I want to ask you this question. Um, well, when I'm hearing your speech, uh, I can, uh, especially when you pronounce "together," um, it sounds like uh, it, it sounds like Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wonder if you have melted the for if if you have melted the former president of the United States or the or the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good question. That's a speech writing melting pot. Uh, did you want to just throw your questions in and I'll yeah, try to speak sure. to it? Um, so I'm actually a 1.5 generation, mm -hmm. I would say, because I was born in China, but I basically grew up here my entire life. Mm -hmm. And um, based on my experience, it seems that what really draws me to like hang out with um, other like Chinese Americans is sort of like, I would say, I would call my upbringing ascetic. And I think, um, so one of the questions that I read from your book was um, when you were surveying, like what defines, how do you, what would you, why would you, what makes call you your, Chinese? What makes you Chinese, yeah. right? And um, my first thought is the ascetic ideal that I live by, I would say. And um, so, like, but I feel like that's a very general <laughs> idea. Like, it applies to every single under underdog group that's yeah. arrived here. And um, 
even from like Virginia Woolf's uh, Three Guineas, like the best teachers, she says, are poverty, chastity, freedom from unreal loyalties, and so forth. And somehow that just doesn't seem very satisfying. There's nothing that seems like, that seems particularly Chinese about living an ascetic life. Okay. And so I was just wondering, um, is there something more? Is there something, some core of like a Chinese core that that I'm just missing that Great question. <laughs> according to you. Great question. Okay. And, and please add your final question. Mine, uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, I'm a Tibetan from India. So just for variety, I just kind of got up and I really, really liked your speech. And it's so uh, inspiring, you know, because we need more. I, I need to see more like you. Uh, and I go around a lot uh, and I don't find like you. So uh, just uh, and one small request, if you do get to work on these, because I'm nowhere like you. I know I'm a very recent generation and I was born in, as a political refugee in India. So, for example, even in my, my own family, I kind of see that, but I can't discuss, you know, I don't like to uh, clean my dirty laundry in public, and, so to speak. But back there, you know, they have like very big families, rich families, and you know how the family interaction changes. So that sort of thing, you know, because China is, they say, rising. I don't, know, I don't believe that, but I'm very positive overall. While we have to tackle these basic fundamental issues that these uh, certain, you know, groups that we are converging and we know who the root causes are, okay. they're trying to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, if you're brave, and you know, because there are so many young kids here, uh, no matter who you are, you know, where, wherever they belong, you know, even if their families are involved in those kind of businesses and games, uh, you know, that uh, thing. Uh, Great. You know, you Thank like you. my most beloved brother, and suddenly Thank you. I've never gotten a scolding from you, but suddenly when you go back home, he keeps like everything, the simplest thing you ask, he retorts back in like scary, you know. A mood or Let me whatever. try to speak to all, all yeah. of this now. So, th okay. Thank you very much. So I don't much need an answer. I just wanted to thank you basically by also bringing just one of the many, many big problems that I see around right now. You know, there's like a lot of going back and forth and, you know, and then the gentleman American guy said, you know, this is the country where yeah, we have, we yeah, we can utilize all the, yes. you know, magic thank part. You. Let, me, let me try to weave these things together. I, I actually think there's a um, a wonderful set of threads here between these final questions and comments. Um, you know, the idea here that in this country, I mean, it, it is a reminder when I speak of the creed, and I may have shorthanded it a bit too much, right? Um, I, I want to unpack a bit what I mean. Uh, as our first uh, questioner just there in, in the series as, uh, pointed out, this country has nothing to hold it together except a creed. We do not share blood. We do not share tribe. We do not share faith. We do not share uh, a common history on this territory. We have a creed. And it is a creed to be found, of course, in certain foundational documents from the Declaration of Independence, the Preamble to the Constitution, the Gettysburg Address, but also in other documents, the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, the I Have a Dream speech, other documents as well that are still being written. This creed that expresses the idea that there is liberty and there is equality and that we recognize that liberty and equality are sometimes in tension that this is the American project to figure out how we balance liberty and equality, but that this is the very purpose of the project. And to me, this is, this is an exceptional thing. I do believe, I know the phrase has gotten a really bad rap over the last decade, the phrase American exceptionalism, but there is something exceptional in this sense, which is that no other country on earth is dedicated to a proposition, if I may quote Lincoln. We are dedicated to a proposition. And to me, that is cause not at all for cheerleading, patting ourselves on the back, thinking we're awesome, chest thumping, uh, getting complacent. That fact that we are uniquely on the planet dedicated to a proposition creates an exceptional burden. It creates an exceptional weight on our shoulders to actually live up to it, to actually deliver on it, right? And so I do think that it is, uh, you know, uh, th this is something I was just up in Chautauqua speaking about this topic of civic religion. I believe that the thing that unites this country, if there is uniting to be done, has to be something in the spirit of a civic religion, of a belief in this creed and a belief that this creed is enacted by deeds, not simply by re reciting the words, but by what we do in community and in country every day and how we engage one another, and how we get literate in power, and how we exercise power, and how we find voice, right? This is how we enact the creed. 
Uh, and I think it is the enacting of the creed, the practice of the creed, the belief in the creed, the recognition that we are still falling short of the creed, that we are forever asymptotically falling short of the creed, even as we make great progress. That is what holds us together. That is what binds us, right? And recognizing that this generation's challenges, whether it is in the realm of how we treat a new wave of immigrants or how we treat, um, uh, you know, whether we allow our gay and lesbian friends and relatives and neighbors and uh, coworkers to marry, uh, that how we live up to the creed in this age may differ from what it was 100 years ago, but it is this creedal challenge. Um, and, you know, this question of asceticism and the severeness of a lot of um, that one questioner's idea of Chinese American life. I just want to close by saying this, which is that on one level, yes, the immigrant experience, not just the Chinese immigrant experience, the immigrant experience uh, is an experience of hardship and sacrifice and having an ascetic mindset uh, and saving and scrimping now in order that the next generation may have more, right? That, that is a universal American immigrant narrative. Uh, what I would say is distinctly and uniquely uh, powerful about the Chinese immigrant experience right now, in this moment again of China, China and America, uh, is that there is, I do believe, there is an enculturated core of Chineseness that can be useful to, that can be a useful corrective antidote to some of the most extreme and unhealthy aspects of American culture right now. Uh, I actually found that, you know, so there, there's a, uh, a wonderful scholar at Brown University named Jin Li. She herself is an immigrant from China. Uh, she's an education psychologist. Uh, and she wrote a wonderful, uh, somewhat academic, but wonderful book called Cultural Foundations of Learning East and West, right? And in one part of this book, she has this table. Um, and you look at this table. On one column, it says European American habits of mind. The other column, it says Chinese habits of mind, right? Uh, and the European American one says cultivate mind, understand world, reach personal goals, active engagement, inquiry, personal insights, being the best one can be, curiosity, pride for achievement, disappointment, low self-esteem for failure. In the, in the Chinese column, correspondingly, it lists perfect self morally, contribute to society, diligence, endurance of hardship, application of knowledge, unity of knowledge and moral character, humility for achievement, shame slash guilt for failure, right? Now, you can take those two columns and you can really turn them into something cheesy and stereotypical uh, about East and West, right? And you can reduce them to very clunky, heavy-handed stereotypes. And yet there is truth to both of them. There is truth in these cultural cores here. And the thing that I would add to this list here, again, in our moment of rampant centrifugal individualism in the United States, is that, an America, is that a Chinese emphasis on rights as duties that with every right comes an obligation is a great and necessary corrective in American life. That the Chinese emphasis on context and not just the star, right, is a great corrective to American society right now. Uh, there, there's this great set of psych other psychology studies that I will tell you about here as, as we wrap up by a guy named Richard Nisbet, uh, uh, who's, uh, who's got a book um, I, I call, uh, called uh, uh, The Geography of Thought. Uh, and he compared Chinese and other Asian uh, subjects and um, European American subjects. Uh, and one famous experiment, he had them all look at a picture of an aquarium, right? Uh, and he had them study the picture of the aquarium for five minutes, and then they took away the picture, and then you were asked to re kind of recount what you remembered about the picture. Uh, and the Chinese subjects, those in China, and uh, to a lesser extent, Chinese Americans like me, uh, what they remembered about the picture of the aquarium was where things were in relation to one another, where everything fit together, where, uh, uh, you know, what the big picture was. Uh, what the Americans remembered about the picture of the aquarium was where the biggest, shiniest object was uh, in the aquarium, right? Uh, and again, you can say, well, that's just a cheesy stereotype, but there is a truth to this. Uh, and this opportunity that we have right now to fuse these kinds of mindsets, to think about the ways in which uh, it's not simply asking Chinese Americans to, quote, assimilate, but it's, a, it's inviting America to bring in and fold in the most adaptive, the most healthy, the most powerful parts of Chinese ways of thought and being so that in the end, America retains its global indispensability. 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for being here for this conversation.